from the Kingdom of Ohio, this is O'Culture with Ryan Peverly. Yes, sir, from the heart of it all and a living room somewhere near the birthplace of aviation, this is O'Culture. I am your host, Ryan Peverly, bidding you all a friendly little hey yo. Welcome to the program. Thanks for being here. My guest this episode, Darren Grimes, Grand Dunlop hosts of the Grimerica Show, one of the best podcasts in the world. Darren and Graham are coming up in just a few minutes. But first, here's your occulted news of the week. The federal war on marijuana continues, and in states like Massachusetts, they're treating it like actual warfare. On the heels of the DEA choosing to keep cannabis on the list of Schedule 1 drugs, late last month, Massachusetts State Police and the National Guard sent a helicopter, several vehicles, and a handful of troopers to the house of 81-year-old Margaret Holcomb to chop down one, just one, cannabis plant and haul it away. Holcomb said she grew the plant in her garden so she could treat her glaucoma and arthritis. Now, medical marijuana is legal in Massachusetts. You can grow it as well as buy it. But Holcomb doesn't have a medical marijuana card and said she hadn't attempted to obtain one due to the difficulty of getting her doctor to sign off on it and also that traveling to the nearest dispensary and paying their prices would be too expensive for her. However, Holcomb's son, Tim, who was present at the time of the raid, told their local newspaper, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, The police told him that as long as he did not demand a warrant to enter the property, and if he didn't otherwise escalate the situation, they would file no criminal charges. Tim said that he believes the raid to have been unlawful surveillance and illegal search and seizure because the officers likely did not have a warrant, which would make their raid of his mom's property unlawful, which of course would lead to some legal ramifications for the officers involved. Now, Massachusetts State Police did say this particular raid on Holcomb's lone cannabis plant was part of a bigger operation that day, which encompassed several other properties, yet only 43 plants were seized in total, and most of the properties raided only had one or two plants each, and none of the property owners involved were criminally charged. So here we have what appears to be exactly what Tim Holcomb said it was, unlawful surveillance, illegal search and seizure, without a warrant. And it's pretty obvious this is the case, because if police are raiding a property, confiscating items from it, and not charging these quote-unquote lawbreakers, well, that's a telltale sign they have no legal right to be on the property in the first place. Because when you charge someone with a crime, you got a bunch of paperwork to do. And if that paperwork says that you raided someone's property without a warrant to be on it, Guess who's breaking the law now? Now, this is just one case in one state, but there's been hundreds like it the last few years across the United States. But it's a microcosmic example of the macrocosmic problem. And that problem is policing for profit. You know, never mind the fact that cannabis is still treated as one of the most dangerous substances in the world. It's not. And anyone who's ever done it can tell you that. And 25 states say it has medicinal value. That's half the country. It's also legal medicinally in Washington, D.C. You know, the place where all of the federal laws are bribed into existence. I mean, you could legitimately have DEA agents living in Washington, D.C. with medical marijuana cards. Their day job is to continue this wasteful spending on eradicating marijuana, but then they go home and get high legally. Or hell, they could just skirt the system entirely and dip into their stash of seized cannabis plants. Because honestly, what are you doing with all of these plants, especially if you're acquiring them without warrants? They can't just hang out in the evidence locker, not without paperwork. So are you destroying them? You know, I'll tell you what, if these cops were smart, they'd sell this shit on the street. Who knows, maybe they are. But like I said, never mind that. The problem here is policing for profit, or maybe even policing for funding in this case. And let's stick with Massachusetts. The DEA gave the state of Massachusetts $60,000 this year for their marijuana eradication efforts. And this money is part of a program to, and this comes straight from DEA.gov, the program is designed to, quote, halt the spread of cannabis cultivation in the United States, end quote. And this money for these states is use it or lose it. If they don't spend it all, 
they won't continue to receive the funding. So what's that mean? It means you have to cook up cannabis raids, as legal or illegal as they might be, to keep your money. It means you raid the home of an 81-year-old woman who's just trying to get by in her day-to-day. It means you confuse okra plants for weed, as some cops in Georgia did back in 2014, LOL. Or it means you have to prevent an epidemic of stoned rabbits and other garden pests, as one Utah DEA agent said last year, L-O-fucking-L. I mean, this DEA program is something like $14 million this year. That's $14 million in taxpayer money to prevent stoned rabbit epidemics and 80-year-old women from feeling better than they did the day before? Give me a break. You know, thankfully, there are some lawmakers in Congress calling for an end to this program, but not nearly enough. And the end is obviously not coming anytime soon to this program, especially when the DEA just re-upped on marijuana as a Schedule One drug. And to be honest, when I look at this list of Schedule One drugs, I see a lot of substances on here that treat a lot of different diseases and illnesses, both physical and mental. Marijuana is one thing, and I've interviewed a cancer patient who took his treatment into his own hands with cannabis and is healthier now than he's ever been, cancer-free for five years. And there's hundreds, maybe even thousands of stories like that out there. Just Google Rick Simpson. But things like LSD and psilocybin and MDMA, these things have been and still are being studied across the world and have shown to have a tremendous impact in treating things like depression and Alzheimer's and autism and even just getting people to quit smoking cigarettes. Hell, heroin, a derivative of both opium and morphine, is used as a pain reliever in small doses in hospitals. By the way, how do these hospitals get a hold of that heroin? Last I saw, Afghanistan produced 95% of the world's opium. Afghanistan. Huh. Well, we did deliver Afghanistan a healthy dose of freedom a few years ago. And we're still there, right? But I digress. That was your Occult News of the Week. My guests this episode, Darren Grimes and Grant Dunlop, the hosts of the Grimerica Show... Before we get to them, here's this week's hashtag sick track. It's from Vestron Vulture. It's called Assault on Precinct 13. If you dig it, check out the links to Vestron Vulture in the show notes. My conversation with Darren and Graham from Grimerica is on the other side. Enjoy!
All right, Darren and Graham from Grimerica are here. Hey guys, what's going on? Hey, hey we're Ryan. not live, are we? No, okay, we're good. not live. Sorry, I should have told. I guess I didn't realize you were asking if we're recording live. <laughs> Fuck no, no. <laughs> Well, I figured that, but I mean, Darren asked me, like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, pre-recorded all the way. Have you guys ever done live before? Yeah, we did for a while there. Really? Yeah. I'm f- not fairly new to the show, but probably within the last, I don't know, eight months, ten months. Yeah, that's probably right around when we stopped. I, wow, oh, really? it's, been a, it's been a year. Really? Has it been that long? That's yeah. crazy, yeah. So we tried using Mixler. I mean, we did use Mixler for quite a while. It's like a... yeah you know chat room and live stuff but the quality of the sound was shitty for people in there for sure which was sucked and then it also just it was a bit of a scheduling challenge you know because we're pretty laid back here so like we'd always be late or we'd have to cancel and then rebook and it just felt like there's all these you know not a lot of people but just some people that were sort of waiting to It'd almost be good to do it just for people that do want to tune in, and, but not even like advertise or anything like that. <laughs> I have some friends that use Mixler. I've never tuned into their stuff though. Is it like interactive, like a chat room, like you said, that like you can type to people like while you're you're yeah. in there? Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. And to be honest with you, for me, that's just too distracting as well. Like I couldn't pay attention to that and what's going on with the guests and all that. So. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why you would want to either. I mean, it would kind of take away from everything. Plus, having the guest be there live would be a <laughs> A bitch to schedule, I would think. Oh, yeah, totally. It was a problem. It was always at a different time. Yeah. 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 Well, especially when you get guests that, you know, live in different parts of the the world, man. I mean, it's hard to... Like, I I was listening to that uh, show with Gordon White, like, not too long ago. And Gordon's Mm -hmm. fucking awesome. And I listen to, like, pretty much any show he goes on. I I listen to, to Rune Soup all the time. And this dude's in Australia now. And I'm like, damn, like, it's got to be a bitch to schedule that kind of stuff with him. Yeah, It'd be, yeah, Australia is actually easier. Why is that? Oh, because it's so far ahead. Yeah, it's, I find it's the hardest is UK. UK to like France and that for that like seven Europe, to ten Europe, hour yeah. range is almost impossible if they don't want to do weekends. If you don't have a day job, I suppose it doesn't matter, but that tends to get in the way. And it might be better if we were back east where it would be two hours closer to them, but we're just at that point where it's got to be like either early in the morning for us or sort of like early afternoon. Yeah, mountain time's really I've never talked to anybody in mountain time now that I think about it. I've done some people in California and, you know, the like even that's kind of hard sometimes for me. But anyways, so um do you need to know anything about the show before we get started with, you know, question and conversations or is it just kind of Can I, I swear? Mean, oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's an important one. That's going to happen. <laughs> You're I get a lot of grief for my cursing sometimes. <laughs> just every once in a blue moon, so you, you've been pretty good lately. It's just for a while there, you're just over. You're going overboard. In the beginning, it was yeah. overboard. The first thirty episodes are overboard. Well, see, yeah. I haven't heard those. I have to go back and and do the back catalog and, and check them out. But, there was a lot of fucking. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of fucking. Like every second word, sometimes I'm. You know, I was that just, should like, be like a my... like a catchphrase, like Grimerica. A lot of fucking. That's pretty good, actually. That could yeah. be a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, it could a be. A lot of fucking fuck, be. fuck. Fucking fuck. <laughs> uh, do you guys listen to, like, Eon Bite? That's weird. I have I have it in my thing, but I, yeah. I don't think I've listened to it forever. Oh, man. Miguel, the guy, he's fucking interesting as shit. And his shows are experiences. Like, the first 20 minutes are him just, like, rambling on, like, interspersed with music and, like, clips from movies. and. So anyway. Yeah, yeah, for sure I will, because I, I did have it there, and I, I don't know what happened. Lately, I've been going down the cannabis rabbit hole. You haven't, or you have? I have been, big time. I downloaded, like, 40 episodes of the Growcast. Oh, I haven't heard that, but I, I that was recommended to me. I, I talked to someone who um does marketing for cannabis dispensaries. Oh, Which, yeah. See, I want to start because we're like only a f- probably like we're to the point now that I can actually I've got the papers printed out in the house that I just need because I've got my medical card. I just have to submit this paperwork and I can grow six plants. Dude, that so would I'm be just sweet. getting ready to start to get serious about growing. This winter is when I'm going to start really. I've grown a bit back in the back in the day, but I mean, it never turned out real great. So I really want to start to. Uh, hammering down and figuring that out by this time next year i'd like to be always smoking my own homegrown buds 
Hey, man, I mean, if you're going to grow your own vegetables or whatever, you might as well go with the weed, too, right? That's the wife's deal. She can grow the food. I'll grow the weed. <laughs> Does your wife smoke with you? Yeah. Yeah? Cool, man. We're both card-carrying. I get these headaches. Yeah. <laughs> you get these headaches, yeah. I That's think how, I you know, it's so easy now. to get a card, too. Like, if it's legal in your state or province, it's just it's so easy to just go grab one, right? Yeah, it's like a rubber stamp, really. Yeah, yeah. we just finally got that way up here, like, in the last six months. Really? Okay. See, I'm in Ohio. We don't have it yet. It was on the ballot um, the last election, and it passed, but I'm not... It's got some weird provisions to it. I'm not really even sure how it works, but it's coming soon, so who knows. Um, I don't get headaches much anymore, but man, I, I think I got some joint pain, you know? Yeah. Sciatica. <laughs> yeah, sciatica. Um, yeah. My buddy went in there, and all he got out of his mouth was single dad, and she was already writing on the pad. <laughs> oh, man. Throughout anxiety and stress. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here. Since you are so busy, it actually means quite a lot that you took some time here to talk to somebody who's, you know, not super famous in the podcasting world. That's all good, man. People take time out of their day to talk to us all the time, so right. it's only fitting. We we very rarely say no. I don't think we've ever said no. Sometimes we can be a bit of a headache to book because of conflicting schedules, but I don't think we've ever said no to anyone. Well, that's good to know, Let's just get into it. How and why did Grimerica start? Well, I moved to Calgary about five years ago now, four and a half years ago, and I met Darren at work, and uh, we had some of the same interests, and we started chatting about all this sort of interesting, probably, oh. I was complaining about the radio, I think. Were you really? That's how you got me into listening to podcasts. Yeah, because I was Cause like, I didn't oh, know man, what a podcast you try these was. Podcasts. And I sent him a couple of my favorite podcasts, because I'd been listening for probably like four or five years already at that point. And uh, Darren started listening to him and he got really into it and we started chatting about all these things and we went to a conference kind of about ancient mysteries and like ancient alien type stuff. And, and then we were like, you know, he was like, well, we could do a podcast. And I was like, well, yeah, we could, I guess. I was pretty hesitant at first because I didn't want to be on social media or have myself out there at all. I was going through a bad relationship breakup and I was pretty scared. But we ended up doing it and that's kind of just how it started is that we had the same interests and stuff and... Yeah, we like talking about all this shit. So it was kind of just fun to be, just to become a part of this whole new media and talking about community. stuff that, you know, you, you normally just don't hear about on the radio. Yeah. And you always want to ask your own questions, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, why would you not want to sit around and talk about your world and the universe? That curiosity, man, just, it's good. This is a good venue to feed that. Exactly. I mean, I was addicted to podcasts to begin with because I could learn about whatever I wanted to learn about at any time for free, basically. So once I started learning about all this stuff, I just got sort of, I don't know, addicted to like just learning about interesting stuff. And then you go down all these different pathways and then we just thought, well, well let's do this ourselves. We can chat with super interesting people. And we were going to just do like a chitty chatty ch show amongst ourselves. And then we decided to do an interview style at the last minute. And thank God we did. Maybe another show will come someday. Yeah, I don't know. I don't feel I, like I, I could, have the, this I, is even tough for us to do somebody else's podcast. Down the road. Yeah. Yeah, those conversational podcasts, they're pretty common, and uh, although I guess the interview style is too. It's, I think you guys have a good hybrid, though. I mean, starting your show with your you know, your chunk of just you two bantering back and forth is enjoyable, and then you get into the guest, and then it's kind of the best of both worlds, right? Yeah, yeah, where, where we don't really have to bring too much of our own shit to the table, right? Because I'm... You know, that's the thing. Like, I'm not an expert in fill. anything. Yeah. Like, I, I, I even feel uncomfortable coming on, like, your show or somebody else's show because I really want to learn from other people and I don't have, you know, I mean, I have opinions about stuff, but I, uh, They're usually wrong. I'm not experts in, <laughs> in, in anything, right? So it's hard to, like, it's hard to sort of ride that line between having enough self confidence to, to chat with a bunch of different people and, you know, admit that you don't really know much. But then, and also not getting like too, letting get the ego get in the way, like, you know, just wanting to have that like sort of airtime and to air your voice. So it's kind of a balancing act in a way, I think. Well, I'm no expert at anything either, so I'm not sure what the hell you're going to learn from me. I totally agree with you. You know, let's get into a little talk about some of your episodes. And I, I'm just going to start right away with my favorite one. I Ooh, love uh, that. Can I guess? Yeah, go ahead. It's going to be Randall Carlson. 
No, I've heard Rando Gordon on a Gordon lot White. of different shows. Gordon White, fuck, that was a, that was a gimme. No, 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 it's actually not Gordon either. Although both are great episodes. Now Gordon's so prolific at this stuff that it's kind of like I don't remember which shows I hear him on. I just remember listening to him talk. Right. He's been talking about these books for months now, and I've listened to about every one he's done. So he's kind of bleed from one to the next. And Randall, I haven't heard him recently anywhere, but dude, that I first heard him on Joe Rogan um, several years ago. Dude, super fascinating. No, my favorite one is Neil Adams. Oh, that's my favorite too. Really? Actually, Randall and Neil are probably tied. I was actually, I can't remember if we were recording this. It might actually be on the road trip episodes, but of all the episodes we've done, Randall and Neil are the only two. I don't want to say no, the only, only two, they're not the, the only two, two, the two but they're the two main that have changed my outlook on the world around me. Those are the, the two people that I am, I would say, almost all in with the two of them. And I would say that uh, Matheson is up there as well. Why or how did these episodes change the way you look at things, man? Uh, I'm a lot more skeptical on a lot right. of things in Graham, which is probably pretty easy to tell. But um, I don't know. For me, it could be just more that that's the things that interest me at the end of the day, like uh, the history of um, Earth or how the solar system works and that sort of side of things has always interested me more than, say, UFOs or Bigfoot or anything like that. I mean, the nature of consciousness, I can get pretty twisted around pretty well, too. But, like, mm -hmm. the inner workings of reality is really my bread and butter, especially around Earth and space and the solar system. And I think uh, both of those guys are bringing... Boy, I mean, shit, we were just down in Washington this weekend right. um, with Brad Brad Young, one of Randall's associates, looking at, at the uh, dry falls and that big uh, dry coulee down there. Hey, did you find because your hat, by the way? I did not. Oh, no, shit, it's gone. Man. Well, I've I'm seen sorry. it. I could see it. I know exactly where it is. <laughs> but it just wasn't worth the trip. <laughs> you should go back and see if it's still there, man. Well, people I'm going were, back and like... People were commenting. You probably don't know this. People were commenting like, oh, man, I know how he feels. I had lost a four-year-old, you know, well-worn hat. I mean, thank God yours was new and it was very... I like, might get like, it back yet because me and Lisa will probably pop in there when we go on our I'll road trip gone. in a couple weeks. So if it still happens to be there, then maybe I'll grab it. Hey, if it's still there, that's fate, and you have to grab it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Back to the Neil Adams show. Let me tell you why it was my favorite. First of all, it was my first personal, like, real deep dive into the growing earth theory, which is just, that whole theory itself just blows my mind. But he deconstructed everything that I knew about science, and then constructed it, constructed the universe back in a more plausible, logical way, and he taught me, I don't know how, how you guys felt, he taught me more science in two plus hours than all of the years of formal education that I've had. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's one like that, and that kind of tied together with, I was, I was listening with, uh, listening to some alternate uh, hollow earth theories, like, you know, away from the people living inside the earth and more just how if gravity or whatever you want to call it works the way we think it does then at some point the dense at some point when you're near the middle all the fucking force isn't in the middle anymore it starts to be kind of like how the equilibrium between earth and the moon is closer to earth so the the center of gravity between the crust of the earth and the core of the earth should technically be close to the core, but not at the core. So, which would make you think that, you know, someplace very close to the center of the Earth, gravity would reverse and would pull the things at the center out. And that, to me, would be the perfect space for production to take place. Oh, man, you know, I don't even remember how he explained pair production, but I, I remember listening to that and just, it just made a lot of sense. And I think you guys both agreed that it, the way that he explained it shattered kind of traditional mainstream scientific views. Does it shatter creationism or is it just, well, I think, I mean, in my opinion, which is, doesn't count for much creationism okay. has been shattered for a long time. I'm not saying that there's no, there's no God or no creator or anything like that. I'm not, you know, qualified to say that. But I think creationism, as it's written down in the Bible or in the Quran or in any fucking book, is not the way it happened. And it's some right. sort of allegory or something else that we're misinterpreting. 
think but I, I think there probably is a creator. Like I'm almost at the point that this shit, you know, whether it's a computer or a hard drive or some old dude with a beard, something had to do something because, you know, it just had to. I should take a step back. I think I meant more uh, creationism in, I guess, the scientific sense, like with the Big Bang. Yeah, I, I, well, yeah I'm not a proponent of the Big Bang. <laughs> I wouldn't say at this point either. Were I you before that talk? It, N- nah, I was I was probably a proponent of the Big Bang up until I started listening to podcasts and and probably within the last five years I've switched my outlook. I don't think I I, I maybe I would have thought I was a proponent of the Big Bang uh, coming into starting the show, but I don't think so because I can remember having conversations with friends a long time ago about how it just you know that that just doesn't make sense. The Big Bang to me you you would equate more to like plugging something in. You know, the um, the one issue that, that I did have with Neil, though, now that I think back to what he was saying, he talked about being in conversations with, like, NASA about Mars, and then he talks about gravity and things like that. Why are we still recognizing NASA as an authority on anything? I mean, if we question government narratives of things, NASA seems like, in the, in the conspiratorial worldview, the only thing that gets, like, sort of a pass from people... Does that, I think like, he's. I think he's doing it to for the benefit of people that um, need that validation. Okay. You know, for people that are still there that say, you know, NASA did, you know, need needs to validate something for them. But I mean, for us, I think it's just it's also interesting that 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 NASA is involved at that level. I think, like, I always get fascinated that NASA's, you know, they're always involved in more scientific studies and more things than you think of. Whether to believe them or not, I, I mean, I don't know. We haven't really gone down too much of the the NASA thing. I mean, I think that's just like a lot of these big companies and organizations is uh, this probably got some good stuff going on, like compartmentalized or different departments or different parts of it, and it's probably got some not so legit stuff going on. I just remember him saying that. I think he specifically said that he believed that gravity did not exist, but. And this is kind of ties back, but NASA's official narrative is gravity does exist. We just found gravitational waves, you know, twice in the past year. We've found these things, and it doesn't jive with me, you know? Yeah, it kind of fits in. See, I, I kind of like the whole electric universe thing as well. Oh, yeah. And it's funny, I was I was even listening to somebody today. I like parts about, of it. I have trouble with the whole... The whole uh, parts recent, of it. recent... Yeah, the recent history of the electric universe is uh, I have, I'm still having trouble with. As okay. far as like an overarching theme, though, of electric, yeah, I like it. I really like, like it. Up until gravity, like that's yeah. You guys have had some guests on too recently that talk about energy and frequency, and I, I, the guy you just had was it uh, Reese Thomas? I think it was his name. Yeah, talking about how this energetic, this vibratory existence that we have. Why wouldn't the atmosphere that we interact in be the same? Yeah, exactly. It's like there's a big disconnect. As soon as you get from that invisible vibrations that affect everyday life to the planets and anything bigger at the macro scale, all of a sudden it becomes physical with with gravity instead of vibration and electromagnetism. It doesn't make any sense. It does not. It does not. We might talk about that in a little bit. I just want to wrap up that Neil Adams thing. I I had one more point to make on that. Actually, it's not really about Neil at all, but have you guys seen these uh, stories or theories that NASA has like staging areas for planets on Earth, and that's where all the photos come from. Um, like in Arizona, that type of thing. Like the I, I don't know exactly. I think there's some in like remote locations in Europe and Scandinavia, and so you know, like a nobody goes to space type thing. Is that? Yeah, it's a, just an interesting theory that I I just stumbled upon within the last couple of months. All the stuff that you see that's put out by them. Like from Mars, for example. Well, Mars has a staging area somewhere in remote Europe, and that's where all the pictures come from. They just tint them red and then put them out there. And then Neil said something interesting, too, that I remember about he had saw this story about um, kids in a classroom were, like, writing to NASA telling them that Mars has tectonic plates. NASA's story about the, the Mars atmosphere wouldn't support the tectonic plates theory, I guess. So when you consider that other alternative, that maybe maybe Mars is staged in Europe, well, wouldn't that make sense if it has tectonic plates in the photos, that it might be here on Earth where we know we have tectonic plates? I think those pictures were from the, the orbit, though, weren't they? So I have trouble with... Well, like not with like not that. from the Mars rover. Like those are surface level photos, aren't they? Yeah, though. Yeah, but weren't it? Yeah, that's right. But I think the 
I think the students were commenting on pictures from the orbiter because I, the I only the only way you can see the spreading and stuff like that is from orbit. <laughs> so yeah, like that, and I have trouble with that because I mean, then you've got to assume that anything like any of the moons around Jupiter, anything we can't see from Earth, that all that shit is just totally fabricated. I just don't think they would bother. I really don't. Maybe I'm wrong. That's Maybe a, though, I'm that's naive, a tough but... one because we had, you know, we had Crow Triple Seven on there once, and he was talking about that lunar wave, right? Yeah, and... but then like fucking a month later, he was changing it from being just facts to like fucking Paul Ryan or whatever his name is. What was his name? The dude from Fast and Furious got Paul Walker. You know, yeah. Paul oh, Walker got sacrificed, to, and you know, like he went off the deep end in other directions. So I've tried. I've, I, yeah. I have no, trouble no, with that. That's kind of what I was getting at. Is is we. We started hearing more and more about that, and it's the same with the flat Earth Earthers as well. I believe saying that yeah. that there's nothing going out uh, past our nothing leaves low Earth orbit. Yeah, low Earth orbit. Which I don't know. We both. I I even agree with Darren. I have a hard time. I have a hard time with that. That well, whole. We're gonna uh, fucking did, send something into low Earth orbit here eventually. Wouldn't the uh, Van Allen radiation belt prevent people from leaving low Earth orbit? I don't think so. No, there's. Ra I don't know. I think that the that we can shield that shit. I mean, we wouldn't have nuclear reactors if we haven't figured out how to shield radiation effectively. And I think the people that I mean, I'd be interested to see. And I haven't talked to, but it'd be interesting to talk to someone like you know Rod Adams, a nuclear physicist, about what he thinks about that. Because I don't have the knowledge level, but I just think everyone I talk to that's saying it's impossible doesn't have the knowledge to tell me that it's not possible if that makes any sense you know what i mean none of them are nuclear physicists or anything of that stature or maybe i'm wrong maybe that info is out there but no oh, the conspiracy would have to be so great though right that's even more that's greater than anything right so that that lady that we talked to on the show from planetary planetary and the only way is if the russians are in on it too right because that's the ultimate fuck no you. it has to be the whole world yeah, right the, so the, emily the russia can tell if the states went to the moon i think there, if we can see fucking galaxies unless it's all bullshit but i uh, then what's the point if it if it's if the conspiracy goes that deep then i don't even want to know <laughs> well i mean if you subscribe to the you know new world order type of stuff then both sides are in on it no matter what like right. they're all yeah. working for the same people I subscribe to some of the New World Order stuff. I mean, some of it's pretty obvious and evidential, but yeah. but to say that, like the you know, like the the lady that we had on Emily Locke Dewalla, who was talking about all these space missions that are going on right now. There's like eleven of them. There's seven on Mars alone, or you know, talking about all these missions going on from all over the world. I just have a hard and time I've believing seen, that I've she seen is. Several she plans. is just making it all up and their whole organization is making it all up and every other country is making it all up like that's just the hardest one well you guys know about project blue beam right i mean yeah that's, that's like something where how the fuck do i know when i'm looking through my telescope that that's real because that's that was crow's point right was that the moon was sort of like holographic yeah but then i i, I don't know i found some videos of like plane exhaust that look awful awful like the holographic moon i mean that's one of those things if it goes that deep then you know what's what's the point what is the point of making the universe seem so vast and like is it yeah. to just make us feel insignificant because that doesn't happen anyway the bigger you make the universe and us being the only one here makes people feel more special so if you're going to try and trick people into thinking well, they're insignificant then really you want life everywhere you want us to find monkeys on mars life's everywhere you're nothing well yeah but we spend all this time talking about ufos and extraterrestrial life that we all just kind of assume that it's out there and then it makes us feel you know a certain way one way or the other some people it frightens and some people you know we're kind of comforted by it but i um, think that's this corner of the world though i like our little community i think on an average like if i walk around my construction site and ask 20 people i'm gonna get some some weird looks if what about what if i go start talking about aliens you know there's still a vast majority of people that don't want to hear well about there's it. still the whole skeptical community that, and that you know and the institutional science that's just totally dissing the whole thing right so i don't know maybe it's to divide us then if that would be the case you know there'd be easier ways to divide us don't you think like 
It's divide as hell. That's what I was saying. Like maybe religion. Just, just use religion. That always works. What do you guys? Think? You? I mean, race here in the United States. Race division is promoted every night on our news media. Yeah, exactly. See, that's the type of stuff that I buy into. That Soros is funding Black Lives Matter, and that they're, you know, the the social justice warriors and the whole academia and institutional like left wing crap. I think, and I'm not talking like like about, about politics. Like I don't care if it's left or right or anything. I think it's all just you know wings are the same bird i think the deep state is in control but but i think those racial issues are the media's fault and whoever's funding all this this stuff i think that's just total distraction i don't think it goes as far as faking the whole like solar like our whole astronomical situation like i I just can't wrap my head around it being that big no, at that point, it just becomes cheaper and easier to just suck it, use guns and make us do what they want. And maybe Bluebeam will come around. Like, I thought Bluebeam was more about a simulating an attack or something or like a, a visual hoax of an attack or of some sort of event, not necessarily like, you know, giving us the a whole hoax of what's up above or low, or lower. Well, not only that, Galileo was seeing Jupiter and the other planets, you know, 500 years ago. Well, that's Unless what that's he wrote in his book, so though. I mean, yeah. that doesn't mean that it was true. That's my whole point, is that we are so quick to dismiss, like, you know, like, you dismissed biblical creationism. We have to, I think, use the same skeptical lens on science as well, the history of science, and all these great astronomers and astrologers and mathematicians and physicists that came before. Like, how do we know what they're putting forth is accurate? Plus, plus, well, almost everything that's come forward has been wrong. Like uh, that's science some ends theoretical up being wrong stuff, in the end, though. That's right? not like I believe that that one hundred percent science ends up being wrong in the end. But Jupiter's still there. <laughs> yeah. Well, unless unless it's being beamed into the sky, and the Jupiter that I see out of my telescope in my backyard is a is a mirage. But then I ask you at that point, what's the point? I don't why, know. That, why that's mirage the, the Jupiter? It's easier just to not mirage the Jupiter, and Jupiter just does, isn't there. But then you don't have science to teach to kids in school. You don't have all these things that are named after, you know, Roman and Greek gods that you apparently sacrifice people for all the time. And Like you were talking about this New World Order thing. Do you guys remember talking to Karen Hudis a few years ago? Yeah, yeah. I mean, nothing she said came to fruition, but she is still beating the same drum every day. It seems like right now it's a lot closer to fruition than it was three years ago. I mean, do you recall her story and what her deal was? Well, she was the banking, uh, uh, the banking. I just call it right? going off the deep end. Oh, <laughs> at some no, point. I th- oh, I see what you mean. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Talking about the pedophilia and all that. Yeah, which I, I I don't know. It might be. Maybe it's going Isn't on. I just remember being hey, fucking blindsided because yes. I did not see it coming, and I was all of a sudden my jaw was on the floor. Yeah. Well, yeah. the pedophilia angle with the elite is a pretty popular conspiracy. Greg on THC talks about that a lot with a lot of his people. It's actually more. I think it's pretty. It's not really a conspiracy theory. I think there's a lot of fact behind it. I mean, I thought there was a lot of documents and arrests and investigations. Like it's pretty. Like that's one of the ones, Ryan, that I was thinking. This was really weird at the time because I just only heard about it a couple times on yeah. the periphery, and then she said it, and then ever since then I've been hearing more and more and going, "Wow, she was onto something." So yeah, that's definitely one of those one of those moments. Well, I mean, if you talk about pedophilia, especially, so let's just take it to one group, you know, the Vatican, the Catholic Church. I mean, fuck, did you see Spotlight, that movie that just won Best Picture? Is th- those guys? That's no. what happens when you don't let the pastors have chicks. Are they allowed to in that one? <laughs> I don't in think they're allowed to. In, the in Catholicism, no, like in because so. in some religions it's cool. I don't think in in like traditional Catholicism that the pastor. No, so maybe it's like Christianity. Is that the one where the where the dude can be married? Yeah, I don't yeah, even know because I know several names. you know tenants of Christianity. You know, pastors and and they're married and stuff. Right? Yeah, yeah, kids and everything with so. kids. Yeah, that's right. So they're even allowed to have sex. But I think that whole you know pedophilia th- ring that the Vatican is running or has run or whatever. I mean, that's been a thing for hundreds of years. Apparently, is that what it is that they've actually been running? I thought it was was just just dirty dirty priests i think it goes no, all the no. way to the top but that's just me i, I don't have any evidence it's for it it's a bunch of dudes that have never had sex or masturbated like if they're actually following their thing but that's the thing is like that's that's the story they trot out to you 
Like, oh, these priests take gun. this. They take this vow of celibacy for God and all that bullshit. You but know? Uh, so yeah, what, yeah, that's that's interesting. I wonder if that's like a ring or if that's just like like I I couldn't even imagine if I had gone all of my life to right now without ever copulating. <laughs> Is that the word? Yeah, yeah man. Well, hey, you, you guys should talk to somebody about sexual energy or you know something in that area. That, that's a pretty interesting. Oh yeah, topic I got one coming up. Yeah, oh, do one. you really? Cool. Yeah, yeah I got a guest coming up in oh, studio. Boy. <laughs> oh boy. Is it a hooker? <laughs> no, no, I, I no, don't I think mean, a hooker really realizes how much sexual energy matters to exist. Well, they might. They might. They, you, you might be surprised on that one. Well, that's true. But I would think they'd be so, you know, just emotionally disconnected from it. Uh, yeah. I guess it depends on the type. Yeah. Hey, if I, can, so, if I can find a hooker who's emotionally invested in me. That's an important criteria, that's for these sure. These are hookers of the future. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, you cuddle. know, sex is more enjoyable <laughs> when there's an emotional connection there. Yeah, so, totally. Absolutely. But the Karen Hudis thing, by the way, just to wrap that up, I, I found her to be super interesting, and I, I'd love to talk to her, too. Her prediction kind of came she's true She's pretty yet, easy to but, get on the Twitter, I think, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. What did she predict? I can't remember. Well, she was talking about um, a lot about, like, UN troops being here. Remember there was, oh, like... Oh, in the States, right? Yeah, several hundred thousand... Troops being here, and then uh, see, maybe that was the plan. You can see how that might have been the plan for fucking Soros and his little gang. Like maybe yeah. the whole BLM movement was one up. What was it before that? It was like the uh, around that time when it have been like, like Occupy? Occupy stuff. Yeah, like maybe that was supposed to instill riots, but the public, you know, they're having trouble with the public because at the end of the day, the cops are public. Do you know what's funny, though, is that, like, if you're really trying to stir people up and get them to riot in the streets as a as a means to implement some new system, like, that's fine. But when you've also seemingly systematically dumbed people down so they're numb to everything, you really think a bunch of lazy Americans are going to riot in the streets over this stuff? Well, you see that, like, Venezuela, it makes you want, it makes you notice how lazy you are when you see, like... Yeah. In Venezuela, when they can get like three million people in the streets protesting, or in the Philippines, wasn't there just a couple million people in the streets in the Philippines? I don't know about the Philippines, but I know the Venezuela story. There was a like a food crisis there, and probably still is. They just know? had enough of it. Yeah, well, they were just like, "Fuck it, let's just go out and change things." And I don't know what they've done with it, but yeah, it's interesting. Venezuela's it's... given all their money to U.S. probably, right, or just their resources. Is that where Buddy was? Chavez that got the cancer, cancer guy. I think Chavez was Venezuela, wasn't he? Uh, I think so. Too. Are we talking about Hugo? He was like the president of Venezuela. Yeah, yeah, but, but he, he's dead he now. He died right? in, in 2013. Yeah, he got cancer. He got the cancer gun. We <laughs> talked to John Perkins about that because he was resisting the U.S. Uh, economic hitmen. Yeah. They got in there anyway. The IMF and shit. Well, I guess it's not U.S. It's like just. Banksters. Yeah. Well, that's cartel. that's what yeah. Karen that's what Karen Hudis was talking about. You know, was the World Bank and the IMF and and all that stuff about returning the gold to the people of the world, taking it out of the hands of all these banksters. But um, I wanted to talk to you guys. Sorry to transition, but I want to talk about UFOs for a minute because I know you guys are really into UFOs. Where do you guys stand right now as to the existence of them? Because I've I've kind of taken a step back on. My own view of it, I was certain that, you know, ETs existed, that UFOs were real, and now I'm kind of second-guessing myself. I was wondering if you guys have second-guessed that recently at all. You want me to go first, Darren? I can go first. Okay. I don't think there's any aliens visiting the Earth. What about if there's UFOs? any UFOs or military or black world. Kind of where I'm at, too, man, to be honest. What? Now Grab can go because his answer okay. will be a whole lot more exciting. No, no, not at all. No, but no, but I mean, I was gonna do the first thing I was gonna do is separate the two out, right? Like right. UFOs and ETs can't be in the same sort of context, right? So there's right. definitely legit UFOs, all kinds of types, and all for many years, and all kinds of credible evidence of UFOs. But whether they're ET or not, I, I don't know. But I do think that something is interacting with Earth, and I don't know if it's. Um, uh, extraterrestrial or interdimensional or more even more consciousness related or spiritual related or whatever like i really have no idea but something is interacting like there's enough evidence from for me and i've seen enough myself of people 
intentionally interacting with something and having something interact back. And, uh, and my, my sighting was somewhat of that type of example. So something's going on, but I mean, whether it's ET or not, who, who knows? We, I don't think we just have that, uh, you know, the people that say they're sure, I mean, it's, it's only coming from, you know, the ETs themselves or some sort of other consciousness. So it's, I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't think, but I do think there's lots of stuff flying around in the sky that's physical and, uh, it can't fly like our commercial aircraft, whether that's commercial military or commercial commercial, like it's, 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 there's something, there's something flying around that with capabilities that we don't understand. Have you guys heard, uh, Grant Cameron at all? Oh yeah, man. He's one of our favorites. He's been on twice, I think. Maybe I have heard him on your show, but he was just on Skeptico too. I don't know if you heard that podcast. Yeah. Yeah, I did. It was good. But yeah, you know, he has that UFO consciousness link. And um, man, there's a great theory, too, that um, UFOs only appear to people at a certain level of consciousness. Have you guys seen or heard that before? Yeah, that's interesting to me. Yeah, that's hard. That's a hard one for me. I I kind of understand in some ways it makes sense, but in some ways it's disappointing because I well, then why did it? Why did I have an interaction back in 1990 when my level of consciousness was shitty? Why can't I get it now when I want Maybe more you of an needed it to kind of can. raise your consciousness or raise your vibration yeah. or whatever yeah, word but, you yeah, want to put yeah. in there. I just wonder, like, there's all this talk about disclosure, you know, like, especially now with Hillary running for office and John Podesta's back in the news, you know, somewhat yeah, with, yeah. with that. And I have an issue with that because I'll, I'll tell you, man, just knowing how the system works. If a politician in America went on TV and said we're being visited and all this other shit that comes along with that, why would I buy that? Why would I yeah. assume that this disclosure is real? Well, and why have why have all these people behind the scenes, Stephen Greer and all these guys, fought so hard for this? When, to be honest, if if you're fighting for the government to come out and say it when they've continuously lied to us about this kind of stuff, why would we believe it? Is it just using confirmation bias against us? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, the funny thing is, is that if they came out and said it, all of us wouldn't believe it. But it's it would be for all the other people that have always been in denial. That they they're the ones that will now believe it. I don't think the government will come out and do that. I think it'll be a slow drip, drip, drip disclosure. Well, that's kind of how it seems to be starting, you know, with this Planet Nine stuff, which I yeah, think used yeah. to be Planet Ten, right before before uh, Pluto before Pluto was, got booted got booted yeah. out of that. And then, um, you know, this alien megastructure story that surfaced, what, last year sometime, I think? Yeah, and then another one, they just found another one. Say what? They just found another alien megastructure. Oh, it's not the same one? No, they found another one. (laughs) Where is this one at? I I don't remember. Well, then there's that close planet, too, as well, that has... Alpha uh, Prox. Yeah, that's, like, super close to us, and it's in the Goldilocks zone, and it's got rocks like 4.2 light years i think yeah so yeah maybe that's part of it yeah but i don't think they're going to come out and say it because it's just it's all the other a lot of the other cultures south south america ones, france they accept that this is a reality it's just the u.s that you know and then bleeds into canada that they don't accept this reality but did you go to alpha proxima oh yeah for sure because when you came back it would be like a thousand years later <laughs> if relativity works the way it's supposed to. (laughs) That's kind of what I was going back to earlier with this whole mainstream science narrative that's pushed out there. I just have a real issue with that. My my discernment level, I think, is I'm now seeing through what I thought was believable science. But then, like, I don't know which one of you said it a few minutes ago, but science is always wrong in the end, you know? They're always just left shaking their head like, well, I don't fucking know. That's the, well, the problem is it's these asshole spokesmen for science of the new generation that are the problem, right? Your Neil deGrasse Tyson and your Bill Nye's and your guys like this that are just, they're spitting this shit out like it's actual fact. And you're making your documentaries like it's actual fact. And I think we've forgotten along the way that these are all just theories. And uh, I mean, so far, some of them worked out pretty good. But then when we look at stuff that's really small, it all falls apart. So, you know, obviously we're missing something, but nobody wants to talk about that. So I think I think I think like, like if you just go underneath that level of television and making money and your science spokes holes and go down to the people doing the real science. I don't think I think I mean, they'd tell you that that's their best guess. 
maybe that they'd admit it. But I mean, I mean, you talk to a lot of people, and they say when you talk to these people off the record, they'll say this and this and this, but then they don't get their grant money. There's a huge uh, good part of science happening too. Well, first of all, I think that they keep equating our technology to science, which it's not. Right? Technology is different. I mean, science might. If I get hit by a car, I'm pretty happy. That's that's engineering, right? That's you know, but they they want to combine engineering and science and say, well, science is why we got our, you know, iPhones and all that kind of stuff. Well, it's not. That's not really the same thing. Well, kind of it is because there's a lot of science involved. But it's more engineering than. It's no, it's engineering now. It starts out, the scientists design it and create it, not and the engineers build it. No. No, not Yes, do you know how much fucking computer science and fucking programming and shit is in this thing? It's not engineering. There's a whole lot of science in there. So the, the, there is some cool science going on with, like, biohacking and, and, and all that. There's oh, yeah. a whole bunch of health and fitness stuff happening, but I think there's a disparity between our institutions and our academia and then what's happening at a, a, a smaller level. Like, there's all this leading-edge science going on that's just not making its way to anything useful, like, it, as far as mainstream goes, right? Like, mainstream and academia and all this is just in denial of all this other stuff that's going on. And that's because they only study the material world. After a while, doesn't that just become not interesting to study when you keep studying the same shit over and over and over and you still yeah. don't really come to any definitive conclusions i mean come no. on. And, and and anything that doesn't meet that physical paradigm just gets tossed into a little bucket on the side it's like oh right. that doesn't exist because it doesn't meet this paradigm well let's talk about a little bit more spiritual thing let's talk about psychedelics for a second because i remember as i was going through your back catalog recently you guys did a show <laughs> on mushrooms right well i i wasn't yeah, yeah. Darren was. that'd be hard Darren to find. Was. Sorry, sorry. Part. I should have clarified allegedly. that. No, no, no. Allegedly. That's okay. it's all good. There was other people there too. I was just the chap, the sober chaperone. Yeah, you were the. Uh, what do they call that? There's like a. I forget what the term is, but you got to have like a like a trip nerd. Watcher or something. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, but what you know, I have a friend who grows grows his own mushrooms, and I was like, hey man, we should record a podcast on mushrooms. He didn't think it was a good idea though. Did you end up thinking that was a good idea afterwards? Did it come out all right, you think? A lot of people really liked it. A lot. Of, it was funny because I remember getting feedback like two years later about people getting contact highs from the mushrooms I had eaten two <laughs> years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but it no longer exists in the back catalog. You, you deleted it? Yeah. Why'd you do that? Uh, I don't want to talk about it. Oh, I know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There came a point when it couldn't be around, really. So yeah. I just, it was better not, you know? Yeah. I mean, they, there's still versions of it out there. I think there's one on YouTube somewhere. I think Gainsford might have posted one to his account. It, it's guaranteed there's still versions of it out there. Yeah, but you took it out of the feed. But it's not in our feed. I was it would, say, be, tr- I it would be tricky to it. find. I didn't see it in your feed, but I, I heard you talking about it on some other episodes, and I was like, oh, i got to find this, but I couldn't find I it. I think so. it even still shows up. Like, it'll show up, but when you go to download it, it's going to give you an error because the yeah, file's not there. Not available. And okay. I don't even have a copy of that file anymore, but guaranteed it's out there for sure. Have you guys talked to Dennis McKenna or anybody like that? Couldn't we remember if you had or not. Dennis I didn't McKenna make was like that. our fifth episode, I think. Yeah, we've done a few on psychedelics. Yeah. I'm trying to get into them more, to be honest. Not just, like, research and reading and talking to people about it, but actually experimenting with them. Do you guys experiment with them a lot? No, I, I don't. I haven't no. uh, touched anything for over eight years, but I used to... I mean, I've done acid and mushrooms and stuff before. What? Did you have bad experiences, or what? Not with psychedelics, just with other drugs and alcohol, so... Okay. I just decided that it's better that I don't do it at all. And Darren's tried mushrooms and, yeah, all, all kinds of psychedelics too, I guess, eh? Yeah. The problem when I did it back then is I didn't have enough reverence for it. I, I was more sort of in a, a party state, probably, uh-huh. drinking most of the time instead of just enjoying the psychedelics for what they should be enjoyed for. So you were pro-psychedelic. Yeah. Not all the time, but a couple times a year. That's what I'm saying. Sure. Like, I, I don't, I think, you know, everything in moderation, right? But it just seems like, you know, it's not like we're going to on ayahuasca retreats or anything. I, I'd like to, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. And I don't know, I'm almost a bit of a pro to it. Like, I don't, I, there, there are certain, certain drugs that I do, I do think people should be yeah. using more. 
marijuana, I'm for, I'm marijuana for, and mushrooms are two of them. Yeah, I'm, if I'm people for them ate too. more mushrooms, just not for me. That's all. The world would be a better place. Yeah. And I if mean, people smoked more weed for their problems instead of taking right? pharmaceuticals, the more world would probably be a better place. Yeah. And if you could uh, go to the go to a coffee shop and smoke joints easier than you could go to a bar and get drunk and make bad decisions, then I think the world would be a better place. Pretty natural too, you know. It's hard to you know, we use it, but it's fairly natural. I mean, back in the state of wine, when you think about it, humans have been drunk for most of their history. Right. Darren, you have some Native American blood in you, right? Yeah, 50%. How much into, like, Native American mysticism have you researched? Not a whole lot. Oh, okay. I assumed you might, you know, just because it's your heritage, I thought maybe you might have some good stories about Native American legends. Uh, I haven't researched much I into think it so, either. But, but no, I... I uh, you could probably I use some more of that. I yeah. probably could use some more of that. When my, as my kids start getting older, they'll probably... The more like, we missed the powwow this year, but we're probably going to go next year. So as my kids get older and I have to start explaining to them, then we'll probably just learn together. That'd be kind of a cool bonding experience to learn about you know your heritage and, and the, the kind of myths and legends from your culture. I think that'd be really cool to share with your kids. Yeah, that's right, because I was raised out of the culture completely. So One of the things I hear you guys talk about a lot, or maybe not a lot, but is uh, you know kind of geoengineering, weather modifications. Mm-hmm. Graham, I think you have a... Or there's like a little clip you guys play. That, Graham, you're an all-in believer in chemtrails, right? <laughs> No, he is. Uh, uh, he no. is. No, not at all. That's the problem with a lot of these conspiracies is there's so much disinformation out there, and that the people think you're either like you're on way on this one side or way on another. Like you either believe that chemtrails are, you know, this huge program to poison everybody and to you know dumb us down and all this stuff, or you don't believe in them at all. But I think there's a middle ground there where there's weather modification going on. It's been going on for decades, and it's affecting affecting other things so i'm kind of in the middle on that we can hop online and see all these companies that sell these services and products right yeah they're they're all contractors with government agencies and whatever but have we really studied how this stuff affects human health you know spraying shit into the air like do we know what the effect of that is on us I think some people say it's pretty bad like i'm not i'm not disagreeing that that has a negative effect i just think that it's it's more likely that than than um, a whole whack of chemicals being sprayed to like to kill us. Isn't I, it I just don't... fake clouds to stop the world from warming up? Well, it's could it could be fake clouds to stop to to affect the weather, which is affecting other things. But I don't know. What do you think, Ryan? I'm with you on the um, the truth is in the middle somewhere. So you take the extreme conspiratorial view of it, and then you take the the exact opposite of that. It's it's got to be in the middle. It's obvious that it's going on. I drive to work and back every morning, and it's interesting to me because I I drive west to east, so I'm driving towards the sun when it's rising in the morning, and then on my way back I'm driving as it's setting, and they're always spraying in front of it. So in that in front of what? In front of the, the sun. So obviously you're trying to block out the sun for some reason. If it really is to keep the planet from warming. Okay, I get that. And that's what they tell the pilots, too, by the way, from what I've read and heard. But then there's the other part where, well, if you're blocking out the sun, you're blocking out essential uh, nutrient that we get from it. Yeah, which is becoming more and more important, actually. That's kind of this biohacking stuff, right? right? They're saying that UV is really important. It's like light and water and electromagnetic and magnetism. Light, water, and magnetism are critical to health, apparently. Like, more so than food and exercise and all this stuff. Like, there's some pretty interesting research talking about that. Yeah, you're right. If they're blocking out that, whatever the reason, it's, it's, it's could, it could be really unhealthy for us, plus all the chemicals as well. And then you also hear these stories about me- people measuring the jet fuel, and it's got a whole bunch of ad- unnecessary added bullshit in there, chemicals. You know, so I mean, who knows? Is is it then multi layers? Like, is it, you know, unbeknownst pilots spraying through through uh, engines with corrupted jet fuel and people? Is it corrupted? People, though? Uh, I would argue that that's just where they dump the extra shit because it won't quite fuck up the fuel, but it's still gonna bring up the waste well, so that saying. they make that's more what, money. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, it could be. It. So you think it's not technically corrupted jet fuel? It's just 
I meant um, weighted yeah, with extracts that otherwise they would have to dispose of. So they save the money disposing it and sell their fuel for more because there's more of it. No, it's added. It's an additive. Somebody's adding it into the jet fuel. That could be. That's one of the levels of the conspiracy. So yeah, I would. I would. No. Oh, I thought you were going the other way with that. I was almost ready to agree with you. No. I was thinking that it's just a company that makes the jet fuel has some shit that they might have to take to the dump. Right, but they can right. also just throw just, it in the jet fuel, and not only does it make more jet fuel, so you make more money, you save the dump fee. But, but I mean, I was just showing ground pictures reason. of chemtrails from 1962, so right. you know, when it's you been think going about, on a like, long time, I guess. You think about how like plants grow. What do plants need to grow? Light and CO2. water. CO2. Yeah. And yeah, CO2. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And then there's that whole electromagnetic part to the world as well. Does electromagnetism prove the electric universe theory on some level? Or are they not that connected? No, I think that's what it that's what the gist of it is. I think that because you can cuz cuz we can measure all this electromagnetism on this scale. I yeah. think what the thing is is that it's that it's everywhere and the universe is filled with it. So instead of it being dark matter and dark energy and gravity and all that, it's electromagnetism. And all these forces that are, yeah, that's it. Which tend to make more sense than everything's moving at the exact perfect speed that it needs to so that it doesn't either leave orbit or crash into the solar system or into the sun. Nothing leaves orbit. They don't crash into the sun because they are locked in position. Hmm. I've heard that, um, you know, if the deep state is in charge, which we can pretty much assume they are, right, that nothing they do is for just one reason. Uh, yeah. Mm. So it, it's got to have a multiple purpose. I guess it doesn't have to, but... But they would utilize it, it for multiple purposes, yeah. I just think when you deprive us of sunlight on some level, that essential vitamin, you know, like UV, vitamin D, I mean, we need this stuff to be healthy. So when you take that away from us, you know, that's why everybody's fucking sick. You know, well, that and, you know, all the shit you consume, but... Sugar. Yeah, sugar, man. I mean, have you guys talked to Rick Simpson or anybody like that? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't talked to Rick, but I talked to somebody who was a biochemist and stumbled upon Rick's story online. And then he worked in cancer research and hospital administration for 20 years. And then he was diagnosed with his own prostate cancer and just like kind of on a fluky whim came across Rick Simpson's story right before he was set to to go for like radiation and then decided to do his own research in the PubMed, which I guess is a big network of medical research yeah, and data yeah. that these people have access to in these fields, and found legitimate scientific and medical studies on PubMed about cannabis curing cancer and shit like that, and decided then to, to not do chemo, not do radiation, went the Rick Simpson route, and within six months, this 70-some-year-old biochemist had cured his cancer, and it hasn't been back for like five years. Wow. That's great. Yeah, that'd be cool. He's probably good. like cooler. He's probably cooler. He's really lazy though, and he gets the munchies all the time. Cannot no. fucking equate yeah. laziness with pot smokers. That is not okay. <laughs> That's like me associ oh, associating sorry. being short with Nazism. Oh my god! What? Yeah, it's well, that crazy, right? Now you know how we just felt. I don't. Well, I don't know about that, man. I don't know about that. <laughs> Wasn't Hitler short? Well, you know, I'm only 5'8", so... Oh, shit, sorry. Well, but you, I was equating you was, on my side of the line. Yeah, he was talking about me. I was oh. talking about him. Okay. Because he was saying that all pot smokers were lazy. Or he was insinuating it anyway. To be honest, when I'm high, I'm pretty fucking lazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I eat a bunch of junk nice food, man, so... <laughs> You got to get on the sativas. I yeah, I'm I'm not on that. But like when I do smoke weed, man, I am not. I'm not looking for apples and oranges. I'm looking for Fritos, you know. And <laughs> no, that's not the weed's fault. That's uh, supermarkets and conditioning yeah. and advertising and a oh, whole bunch so, of things. Okay. That's people who have hijacked the, your body's state and the things that you know. Do so you think if we weren't so addicted to sugar that if you got baked, you'd you'd want more like fruit and stuff like that, like natural desserts? I don't know. I think it's fake my, It's though. just whatever you're hooked on, right? I'm sure lots of people do get snowed and eat apples and oranges or eat fucking 
uh, dots or berries or whatever uh, whatever their I thing know. is. My gotta, my addiction is chips. Like I, you, I'll, I'll never eat. I, I don't disagree. eat. I won't eat chocolate and shit like that. I don't eat that shit. What neither do I, man. I'm I'm sugar free. I eat all organic, oh. non GMO, and I still when I get high, I just want a fucking Big Mac. <laughs> yeah. See, I don't. I uh, my weakness is chips. But other than that, uh, and I, I equate more that because I've always eaten, like ever since I was a kid, it's been chips. Chips, <laughs> chips, 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 chips. So that's well, now it's What's your favorite problem. kind of chip, man? Oh, I'm not. I could never commit to one. If I, like I'm the kind three, of guy, if, if I chips. walk by some chips and there's a new flavor, I'll buy one of each new flavor. <laughs> because, uh, and, and it varies. Like I remember when I was a kid, I always really liked like the... Uh, what is it, Hostess? No, Old Dutch. I used to really like the Old Dutch barbecue. But I go through phases now. I really like uh, mashed potato or no, fries and gravy. When those come out, there's few and far between, once every couple of years. So. Is that like a poutine flavor? A little bit, yeah. It's a Just little bit no, poutine-y. No cheese curd flavor in there? No, you can get poutine too. Yeah, you can get poutine. You can't find but that I think down the here, poutine man. one, they threw some fucking bacon in there, and I hate the taste of chip bacon. You know, they throw that. I don't know what the fuck they throw in it to make give you the bacon chip taste, but any chip that has that says it has bacon flavor, it has that mm-hmm. same fucking disgusting thing that I cannot deal with. Yeah, I used I'd to say eat Old those, Faithful uh... is Miss Vicky's salt and vinegar chips. Oh, Miss Vicky's got some good chips in general. Yeah. Oh, I love them. They're all cr- you can tell they're just you know they seem more natural. I wonder what's in the ingredients. To, to be honest, when it comes to chips, like even if it like advertises that they're natural or you know somewhat healthy, I'm just gonna assume that there's still shit in there that's not good for you. Oh, exactly. Because yeah, that's, right. well, that's well, what it's I'll, like. I'll, like, I'll make my own chips if I if you know if I had more time, I would make my own chips because I get in a phase where I'll do it for a while. But the only problem is when they stick to the pan. If like, everything goes good, it's no problem. But if you fucking like space out for like an extra thirty seconds, then they all fucking burn to the pan, and now you've got a fucking mission on your hands. <laughs> hey, do you guys up there have like all those different flavors of Lay's that, that they put out for like a competition every year now? Oh yeah, that's the best time of year. <laughs> that's the best time. That's like yeah. Christmas. I haven't had any of those flavors because I I don't eat a lot of chips anymore. But when I do, um, I get like uh, like non GMO kettle chips. I, I guess is what I look for the most. It's hard to like pass by Lay's where they have all these weird funky ass flavors and just not buy them all. It sounds like you do buy them all just to try them, right? That's right. Absolutely. I've always really liked potatoes in general. I love French fries. I love pan yeah. fried hash browns, mashed potatoes, right, anything man. potatoes. That's, I'm all over it. Those are carbs that break down the sugars. You're hooked on sugar still. Yeah, yeah, that is. So are you completely sugar free? Because I was just arguing with someone the other day that says, you know, that's the body's that the the uh, the human's body natural state is breaking down sugars for fuel. I can't say I'm completely sugar free. I try to avoid all of like the artificial sugars. Yeah. Um, sucrose, you know, things like that. High, f- high, f- high, so, high fructose. So what about yeah. carbs that break down into sugar? Where did they fit in on that scale? I try to limit my intake of carbs in general, like a starch. So like we're so talking. So a potato more of a starch? Yeah, pasta is a starch. You know, potatoes are starch. Rice is a starch. Those kind of foods break down into sugar, and I I try to limit my intake. I have a Chipotle problem, though, so nice. I'll go to Chipotle like two or three times a week, to be honest. You know, I'll get rice in the bowl, but... If, well, rice can't be bad for you. I yeah, mean, half the fucking planet's been right, living yeah, off that's, rice for that's fucking kind of the last 10,000 years. It's like, there's got to be a good balance there between... You know, if a whole fucking continent can eat just rice and be the thinnest people I'm on saying the half the planet. Half <laughs> yeah. the planet, rice is their main fucking right. source of fucking food. Is it Three billion people rice? for sure. Is it that, that GMO golden rice bullshit that you hear so much well, about? Well, yeah, you can't. I don't think you can be the white rice, right? If you're doing like, I mean, fucking yeah, Indians have been living off yeah. of wild rice for a couple thousand years too. Yeah, definitely. So I, I do try to avoid all that. And that actually started after I talked to that biochemist that I told you about because he's the first person that told me that, you know, sugar is what feeds cancer cells. So yeah. I was like, okay, yeah, well, right. when he was diagnosed, he had to cut out all sugar to be able to effectively treat his cancer, even, even with the cannabis oil. 
Yeah, that's even down to fruit. You can't even eat fruit anymore. Yeah, I don't eat a lot of fruit, but I do like to have an apple and a banana almost every day. But that's that's really the only sugar that I would take in on it. I mean, you have your natural yeah, sugars that come out in everything, but... Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, Darren, weren't you talking about cutting out sugar there? You were on I'm that shooting for, for a the couple... new year, yeah, the and, new year yeah. doing something. Like I say, I'm not willing to to commit. Me and Lisa were kind of talking about it last night, and I don't want to go... Because she's of the mind that it's all or nothing. And actually, you came up because I was like, that's kind of like your approach with alcohol and drugs. And I've never had that sort of mindset. And she's the same way with sugar. She's like, well, it's got to be an all or nothing. And I'm well, like, I'm just trying to cut back. And I'm like, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm not an all or nothing person. You know, like I quit smoking a couple of years ago. If I go up for drinks, usually I end up having a cigarette. But never start smoking again. I'm done oh, with it. Well, yeah, that's what you say now, but in two years you'll be smoking. This is no, what happens. No, it's the same thing that people said when I quit drinking. It just doesn't happen. I don't have the personality that I can't just not do things. Hmm. So if I quit sugar, it's going to be more of the, yeah, I'll cut it out, or maybe yeah. I'll try to do a Monday to Friday or a Monday to Thursday, but if I want to bake a cake or have a pie or if I go to someone's house... Yeah. I'm never going to be the type of person that's not going to eat at your house because, you know, you're having sauce on it that has sugar in it or, you know what I mean? I could not, it, it, that to me is just, I'd never be that type of person. Life's too short, man. Life's too short to fucking yeah, say, oh, I'm not, the problem I'm is not having those how fucking ribs. Some of these things are, it's hard to, you know, like when you start going down this little healthier road, you feel better when you're healthy and sugar, like you can start feeling it negatively yeah, in your body and you can... I'll never get to the point that I'm going to... I really enjoy food too much to limit it that much. Well, How many people thought veganism was so good for you, right? And look what's happening not, now. Yeah, That's why I said, man, moderation Butter, and balance. Everything they told me yeah. about fucking what was good for me for food turned out to be wrong, too. So yeah. why should this fucking, this fucking wave be any different? No, I think this is the wave. This is the end wave. Yeah, that's what everyone and every wave thinks. I don't think so. That's why my fucking mom's been eat, drink, eating margarine her whole life, because she was on that wave where they told you margarine was good for you. Like, there's no, <laughs> Saying that, this is the final wave, is as ignorant as saying no, that. No, no, I, I don't mean the everything. final wave. I mean, the first, as far as food goes, it's a pretty big wave, I think. But it's just another wave. I don't think it's just another wave, no. Because we're finding out how fucking fucked up the food industry's been for like... 50, yeah, that's, 60 years. That's we fine. knew it before a little bit, but, the, but now, this, we know now it's going to overcorrect. People are going to sh- cut out sugar completely, and bad things are going to happen. That is my prediction. Just like when people cut out other things completely, and then other shit you didn't think of that takes a long time manifests. And it's like, okay. oh, I don't know. So, For how long is fucking fat the ultimate evil? And it turns out, oh, you need fat. That's what I'm saying. That was part of the. The big wave. That's part of it. That's sure that is that. a correction in the industry, and I think the same thing will happen with, because it's like, sure, like I was thinking about it the other day because we were talking about the seasonal fruit thing. Fruit seasonal here, but in other parts of the world, it's not. People are eating fucking fruit every day, all day. Yeah. yeah. Like I don't. Like, I'm not saying it's the same thing with global warming and shit like that. I'm not saying pounding fucking cupcakes and sugar and everything is good for you. Not by any stretch of the imagination. But I think if people went the route of cutting out, I mean, if you've got cancer, that's a different story. But I don't think the humans are meant to live 100% sugar-free either. You said no refined that, sugar. Yeah, but, that's that's a, that's a good separation there. Refined but sugar. honey and and fructose and yeah. things like this are are yeah. things that we've evolved to to have. So I think that sugar-free could have the same kind of blowback as uh, what was another one? Cholesterol, right? Mm-hmm. No cholesterol. Well, it turns out there's good cholesterol. Oh, there's good fat. Oh, butter's not so bad for you. <laughs> Definitely said, better than you for you than what is what is it? hydrogenated cooking oil. Yeah. Is what what's that? Is that what margarine is? Another way to sell you that GMO canola. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you guys stand on GMOs up up there? I mean, down here it's a big issue now. Um, you know, we're passing laws that restrict. Or I guess don't even restrict, but make it not necessary anymore to label it. And not that a company couldn't voluntarily put it on their their labels, but now, according to some recent legislation that's been through Congress, I think that you, that's you funny don't have because to. I think that's the way the revolution's going to go. Is it's not going to be, it's not going to matter that people don't label them because people are going to. I already see in Canada a huge movement of people wanting to tell you that they don't. That they don't use them, what? right? Like there's, yeah, there's yeah. now a seal of approval. There's a non-GMO seal of approval that is yeah. all over the grocery store, and I make sure that uh, rice, 
any almond milk or soy milk that you're buying, anything I buy like that, I make sure it has that non-GMO tag on it. Likewise, yeah. I should do that. I don't know if I notice that on everything. Yeah, because even if I can't go organic, because I don't, I'm, I'm not a. My wife is, but I'm not all in on organic, especially at the price on at the price point on some things. Right. So certain things I'll buy organic if I can, but at the same point, um, like, um, something like meat, I'm happy enough if it's hormone and organic, uh, at, antibiotic free. That's good enough for me because. Organic's a lot of hoops, right? And people and, can't well, afford it. And, and it's expensive and it drives up the price. But if, I mean, if I go to the farm and buy my meat and I know they're not shooting it full of shit to grow it faster and they, it's stamped... Um, humane sort of Humanely farm? raised is one of them. And uh, PC does the free from, free from ant- antibiotics and free from extra any injected hormones. And that's good enough for me. And then on everything else, at the end of the day, non-GMO is good enough for me. Well, if you like because chips I don't so have the whole thing. I mean, especially in Canada, yeah. like yeah, like Canadian um, Canadian farms and shit like that. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, I think most of them are. I'm not going to not buy, you know, BC Canadian farmers yeah. peaches and stuff like that because they're not not labeled organic. Well, yeah, because I know there's a difference between some people some people's farms that are almost organic. Or they're organic, but they just can't get certified and, and people down the road. Yeah, it's like all the Amish people. or the I think they're called Hutterites out here. But they come up over here and I buy this stuff. And he's like, oh, no, we don't spray no shit on there. Yeah. But he's never going to have an organic sticker. Yeah, you know no, because I mean? that just to get the USDA to your farm is costs a fortune for some of these yeah. small farms. They can't all be certified organic, you know? Yeah. Hey, but Ray, right, I want to. I want to. Uh, we don't have too much time left. Yeah, I want to yeah. make sure we talk about this frequency stuff, like how you're doing your podcast, because uh, that's that's an interesting topic that keeps coming up. Yeah. So I started reading about the difference between 440 hertz and 432 hertz a couple of months ago. Don't know yeah. where I, don't know where I came across it, but it's an interesting thing. The 440 hertz apparently is detrimental to human health at the genetic level. Yeah. Talk- and then um, 432 is called the God Frequency. I don't know if you guys know that or have heard that, but I've listened to some stuff online at the different uh, frequencies, and the 432 is a lot slower. And, and I've noticed the more I listen to it, the, the calmer that I am. 440 really like is a little bit faster pace. The main thing that people say is it just makes you angrier, makes you kind of depressed and puts you in a bad mood. And then when you realize that, all music is recorded at 440 hertz and then yeah. just blasted out all over the place. It makes sense. And I haven't really dug too much into it to talk about it on an intellectual level, but I just decided to try it. I'm going to have some music on my show. I'm going to put it on there at 432 and I'm going to put all the conversations on at 432 and just see how it goes. You know, just see how people respond to it. If they even respond to it at all, you know, they might not even know. But I figure if I, if I tell you that I'm doing it, Maybe you'll pay more attention to something like that. Yeah, well, Darren, can we adjust ours at all here? How do you do that? I don't know. You probably can. What do you guys record in? What kind of software you got? Studio One. Studio One. Okay, see, I do everything on the cheap because I just started doing this. I'm just using Audacity. And And so you can just, it's a setting in Audacity? Yep, I can go onto the track that I'm recording on and I can change the, the rate and I can set it from 440 hertz to 432 hertz. And it's super easy. And it's the it, sample <laughs> rate. Yeah, the, I can only go 441, 48, yeah. 48 or 32. Well, like Audacity has a, a thing where you can set it manually. So it, it has a I little, could probably override it and set it yeah. manually too. The only problem is it is, noticeably though, different? It slows down everything. So if I played this back to you at 432, our voices would sound a little bit slower. Maybe oh, even a little bit deeper. Graham would sound stoned again. <laughs> Probably. But I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it for a few episodes. I'm going to see how it goes. I really don't want to change it because the more I learn about, you know, we've talked about this. Oh, before, yeah. The more I learn about natural vibrations and frequencies, yeah. that stuff, not to use a pun, but that stuff really resonates with me. It, it, makes, a, <laughs> it makes a lot of sense that that would no, affect us, you know? I totally know what you mean. So I went down, I've always been intrigued by sound and frequency and all this, and I've had experiences where my girlfriend was super sick and I used the crystal singing bowl on her and then she got instantly better, like twice in a row one day. Like it's, so I've had some experiences where that's had a, intang- a tangible 
immediate effect on somebody. And then I heard this podcast, so I've been interested, but I never really could wrap my head around the the 432 and the difference between the 440. But I heard this podcast um, from the Ben Greenfield fitness guy, and this is all this this I'm getting into this like biohacking stuff, this health and fitness stuff, because there's all this science. Like a lot of these guys are open to, you know, air, light, water and and sound and meditation and yoga and like all these are things that you know you, you know you really wouldn't think of as scientific but they're these guys are open to it and he was talking to the guy who makes the whole tones musics music michael something or other i don't know if i should look for the name but he was talking about how they all you know each of these whole tones 432 i think 538 is one there's different ones he makes music on on that specifically and it, and it, each one resonates with your organs differently like with a different organ so it really is scientifically shows that this frequency resonates health in a healthy way with your with your genetics and your cells compared yeah, to like 440 five, what you're saying which is very chaotic yeah and you said 538 it's actually 528 and they call that the low right. frequency ah so maybe nice. that works on your heart i don't know but that's just the, the yeah like probably the name yeah. For it. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I haven't got too much into how it affects the different organs like you just said, but I, I, w- I will definitely do it because I'm going to have like a, a blog as part of this podcast. I think I'm going to try to do some more research and blog on that, you know, like why I'm doing it. and then, But, you know, have some actual science behind it and explain why 432 is more beneficial to the listener. Yeah, totally. Yeah, let us know how that goes. I'm really interested to know if we should like try that ourselves, you know. You know, I would say... Next time you cut, like, you know, just take a few short clips and listen to them back at 432 and see if they make sense, you know, because yeah. you can definitely tell the difference in, just like I said, like the speed at which it, I'm talking right now, and it would be just a little bit slower if you heard it at 432 played back, so. Can you adjust the speed then as well? Can you like you sort probably of balance could, it out? Yeah. So is natural just, speech at 440? I don't know. I just know that when you record into this, you know, the technology and software that it yeah. it automatically records at that frequency rate. Hmm. And if that is detrimental to health, then we should rethink that. And I actually talking to some people to get music on my podcast and I just exchanged emails with a guy who does EDM music and he's recording his ne- his next album at 432 for the same reason. He just learned about it. He nice, said, "You know what? Nice. I'm, I'm going to try it and see how it goes." So, so so look into this guy named Michael Terrell and his uh, okay. he's got his uh, his website is wholetones.com w h o l e tones.com got it and he's got the yeah it's super interesting so there's some online tone generator sites where you can listen to just a vibratory tone at these different speeds and i imagine it's similar to you know using singing bowls or something else to just kind of See how it affects you, you know, like see how yeah. if you listen to a tone at 432, you know, take into account what your mood is before and then how you feel afterwards, you know, like after a few minutes or an hour, or, you know, like however long. But yeah, it's an interesting experiment that I just decided to, to try kind of on a whim here recently and I'm, I'll see how it goes. Right on. Awesome. Well, hey, Darren and Graham from Grime America, thank you so much for being here. Huge fan of the show. Is there anything else that you guys want to say? Plug? Graham's an all-in believer in Graham Trails. <laughs> that's kind of what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good, man. Just check out our back catalog for free, and, and if anybody has any suggestions or guests or that we that they like or any feedback, just send us uh, emails. Contact us. We like to keep in touch with everybody. Awesome. And it's grimerica.ca, right? Yeah. Dot .com works, too. Dot .com works, too. Well, we don't yeah. want to give dot .com the business. If you have a CA, go to CA, man. Support your That's own. Right. Yeah, I was thinking about registering grimera.ca. You should do that. That's actually pretty yeah. clever. Yeah. It was That's, actually yeah. a listener suggested. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. Right on. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> man, I wish you would have pulled out more sound effects during this conversation. <laughs> but maybe I, they don't my, I don't have my soundboard here, otherwise it could have oh, got man. out of hand. All right. <laughs> I have this one handy. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, he's got some here. Hey, no problem, guys. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, and I'll definitely let you know how the 432 experiment goes. All right, buddy. Thanks a lot, Ray. Okay. Good luck. Well, there you have it. My thanks again to Darren and Graham from Grimerica. Make sure you check them out at grimerica.ca or search them in iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher. They're all over the place, man. 
And my thanks to all of you who chose to spend a few moments with us this week. Make sure you check out ourculturepodcast.com for our latest blog. Give us a follow across the social media spectrum or everywhere. Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest, Snapchat, Instagram. Again, you've been listening to Old Culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.